we accept the reality of the world with which we're presented. It's as simple as that. We no longer live in a world of nations and ideologies, Mr. Beale. The world is a business, Mr. Beale. Go, go on without me. It's just go. A good soldier never leaves a man behind. Because I wouldn't give you two cents for all your fancy rules if behind them they didn't have a little bit of plain, ordinary, everyday kindness. Life, uh, finds a way. Welcome to Silver Screen Biases. Each week we pick a movie off of IMDb's Top 250 and dig into it. We're examining truth claims in critically acclaimed movies while also examining our own biases. I'm Nelson. This is Jeff. And this week we're joined by nobody, because this is just an episode for Jeff and I and you guys at home. You are welcome. This week, though, what movie are we covering? Das Boot. Very well I done. learned German for this. <laughs> you learned that much I, German? I took a 15... 15- no, I didn't. I didn't this week's it. episode brought to you by Duolingo. <laughs> Duolingo. <laughs> yes. Das Boot, 1981. Yeah. Another World War II film. We've kind of been in a theme the last couple. I mean, in, in the, the order. circle of episodes, yeah. we've been doing a lot of World War II stuff. Yeah. Unintentionally, but so, intentionally. I mean, that's a little out of order only because we did Saving Private Ryan, but that won't come out for a couple weeks. Right. We recorded that. Before we recorded this one, mm. as far as like World War II stuff, Saving Private Ryan and this—that's that's that's specifically what I was referring to. All all <laughs> the episodes that our <laughs> audience hasn't heard yet. I mean, technically Schindler's List was World War II. Oh yeah, yeah, yep, yep, yep. yep. Um, Full Metal Jacket was Vietnam. Yeah. Uh, Hamilton. That's World Hamil- War II. T- no, I don't think so, Tim. Lawrence of Arabia and Paths of Glory were both World War One. Yes. So yeah, Das Boot, uh, looking at World War II submarine from life. From the eyes of Germans. From the eyes of Germans. Yeah. Written by, and I need to, I got to pull this up because there's no way I'm remembering this name. It's based on the book Das Boot by Lothar Gunther Bochheim. Nailed it. Written in 1973. He has a sequel to Das Boot called Die Festung. It wasn't Das Boots. Das Boots. <laughs> no, Die Festung, which is The Fortress. Oh. Which has been turned into a TV series, which started in 2018, titled Das Boot, which is it's it's intended as a sequel to this movie, uh, as the book is. Well, the book. And while we're on that note here, just right now, so this movie we watched, yeah, was it a TV series first turned into a movie, or was it a movie that they turned into a TV series? It's a book that they turned into a movie. And then clipped it up and chopped it up for a mini series. Yeah, because, because it wasn't refilmed, it wasn't remade. At least they just one made of the a mini actors, series out of it. At least one of the actors in this is in several episodes of a show called Das Boot, which came out in the eighties as well. Yeah, but if you look at both and then the, the two thousand eighteen Das series, Boot is is un, is well, different cast and yeah. stuff, but it's intended as a sequel to this yeah. movie. But like the, the if you look at IMDb and you look at Das Boot 1981, yeah. then you look at the TV series, yeah. it's the exact same cast. All the same and cast. And the same pictures. If you look up at okay. the pictures of like like it's like I if I'm not mistaken, they took the director's cut, which is what I watched, yeah. and they split it up and made it amazing. Well, we both if anyone in the comments can correct me on that, but that's what I found out. Yeah, if you know, movie. please comment below. But there Let is a know. there is a mini series from the 80s that I believe is just this movie chopped up and spaced out. Interesting. So, yeah. Um, was this your first time watching this? This was. Mine too. The author, Buchheim, he was a German war correspondent. And the character of Werner in the movie, who is also a German war correspondent, that is like a fictionalized version of himself. Oh. So this is loosely based on his own experience actually being a war correspondent for the Nazis on a U-boat, which is... Mm-hmm. U-boat, I learned, is short for Unterwasserboot. Oh, I thought it was for, I thought it was pronounced U-boat. U-boat. No, it's Unterwasserboot. Unterwasserboot. Yeah. The more you know. Yeah, underwater boat. Uh, budget for this, about $18.5 million in 1980s money. There has been 235.7% inflation. Good for since us. Since 19... No, no, hold on. This was made in Germany. Yes. So, so was, did it, you do the German inflation? So I guess like, what's this compared to the German dollar? <laughs> no, 
<laughs> no, I I priced it in U.S. dollars of the time and then did U.S. inflation. Okay, but you're okay. right. I should have compared it to what that same amount of money would be. Made in but Germany today. I think, I don't know when Germany adopted the euro, but I'm pretty sure the euro is quite new. Mm. It's new to me. All right. Interesting. Not a huge budget. No. $62 million by modern yeah. standards. So, as I mentioned before, the, um, there's two versions of this movie. There's the two-hour and 29-minute standard, and then there's a three-hour and 28-minute um, director's cut. Which is what we both watched. We both watched the director's cut because we, we are into masochism. Um, we like to chew things. We like to chew things, yeah. Yeah. That's what... I know what I meant, said. Okay. What did it... What, wait. We're into... Masochism. Sadism. Sadism, well... <laughs> Since I was the one that provided you with the director's edition, yeah. it could be that I'm the sadist. Mm. But I also watched it, so that you've would been, be I'm the, mas- I'm the I mast to kiss. Mast. I I know a mat to kiss. Yeah. Anyways, moving on. Pretty cute. Um, directed by Wolf- you know who you are, Wolfgang Peterson. Before I get to the, the Wolfgang Peterson, the Wolfgang Peterson. So I didn't know any of the cast. Yeah, but I did look at Wolfgang's list of movies mm-hmm. pretty big in the american spot can i give you some I, I hope you would poseidon never heard of it troy i've heard Perfect of that storm air force one outbreak in the line of fire never ending story all directed <laughs> by wolfgang <laughs> peterson that's huge story. i've never seen never Ending story and i don't plan to yeah don't don't start now yeah, um, well, like, but they, so for a director I've never heard of, those are those are I've heard of almost all those movies except well, Das Boot. Want to know what's particularly interesting? I do want to know what's particularly the interesting. redheaded second lieutenant. Yes, the one who was a bit of a lunatic. He's like always laughing at weird moments. Yeah, he plays a German soldier in Schindler's List. So this is this is the same universe. He's been tight. Yeah. <laughs> This is in the same universe. He's been typecasted as a Nazi. <laughs> and then Herbert Gronemeyer. Oh. He's been in such films as The American, but he actually wrote music for that one. Oh. Most of the big cast on this, like I, I I did some clicking around on IMDb. A lot of these guys didn't go on to do much else. Yeah, How? Because they all sunk with the ship. <laughs> did you see the end of this movie? <laughs> <laughs> I did. I did. Okay. I did. Uh, the captain, though, Captain Lieutenant Heinrich Lehmann Willenbrock. Pure nailing these names. Played by Jürgen Prochnow. Jürgen. I love a good Jürgen. He was Major Mueller in The English Pageant, Judge Griffin in Judge Dredd, and Duke Leto Atreides in the original Dune movie of 1984. Okay. While we're on, while we're talking about the cast, is there any connection to? Not a one. Clockwork Orange. Nothing. Interesting. There was so no any submarines. Sim- no submarines in Clockwork Orange. No, and any, so any similarities that we're going to shoehorn in, we'll have to find ourselves. Uh, a guy eats an orange in this movie. Yeah, yeah. And there's clocks. Oh, I would say that this this reg- regimen of of submarine people, they. They were like clockwork. Yeah. You know, yeah. The, the opening bar scene was very um, clockwork orangish, similar. Like, yeah. Just very super chaotic. Super degenerate. And, yeah. <laughs> so speaking of like clockwork, off the top of your head, what's your assumption? Do German U-boats move faster submersed or out of the water? I, my honest guess would be underwater. They okay. move faster underwater. How much faster underwater than above water? At least double, like okay. at least double the speed. All right. Well, uh, it's wrong. It's in the air, right? It moves fastest in the air. So here's the interesting thing. U-boats submerged had to rely on electric motors powered by batteries. But when not submerged, they were able to rely on their diesel engines that ran on atmospheric oxygen or with the assistance of atmospheric oxygen. They went 17 to 20 knots unsubmerged but only seven to 10 knots submerged. Oh, yeah. And this became a big part of U-boat tactics is we can move twice as fast if we're not submerged, but, we, yeah. but we're visible. So that became a big difficult uh, part for, for characters like the captain. Now, you know, movies can sensationalize something. So 
from what you know of World War II, your assumptions, how long, yeah, 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 that we know of, how long do you think it took on average for a U-boat to dive? On purpose or after a torpedo hits it? You know, it's probably faster on purpose. <laughs> okay. okay. All right. So on purpose, how quick does it take to be fully submerged? Um, I would say under five minutes. 30 to 45 seconds. It can reach 100 to 200 meters. I know nothing about naval warfare. <laughs> so, yeah. So imagine, you know, you're out on deck on a British. Uh, Is it just, a pretty big deck? Yeah. Good for them. So yeah, you're Sorry, you're, you're, <laughs> you're out on deck on a British destroyer. You're scanning the horizon. As you scan past, you catch a U-boat and you whip back, and it's gone. Because thirty to forty-five seconds. That, yeah, that's pretty quick. That's pretty quick. It's fascinating. Um, so no wonder that thus was they, they were they were somewhat. It was this was a terrifying thing. Yeah, for the Allied troops. The Unterwasser boat. I have some other sub boots. submarine movie connections that I want to make to you, but before before I forget this fact, I just want to say this little portion. I believe it's rated R. IMDb did actually not have a rating, hmm. but when I Googled what is Dust Boot rated, it came up R. So I think it's R. Well, since we don't know what it was rated and we only have IMDb as our source, let's kind of jump to one of our wrap up questions early. Okay. Do you think what would you rate this as a content rating? Outside of some of the terrifying, frightening, um, underwater, almost scary movie type suspense scenes, you know, of them being in the boat and stuff. There's some, you can't see it, but there's implied (laughs) at the beginning of the movie when they're peeing on the car. Yep. I wasn't looking real hard, but I did not see any. I looked real hard, didn't see a one. And then the bar scene at the beginning, there's a lot of just drunkards. Like Yeah, and then there's like, some there's, there's some perverse there's no nudity in this no, movie. There's outside sexuality of, and right, sensuality. Right. No outside, again, outside of the potential for there's groping very quick, and kissing. Yeah. I think you Honestly, can get away with PG thirteen. Yeah. Yeah. It is a frightening movie, but that's not necessarily a, a reason for rated R. So no. and in the dubbed version that I watched I didn't hear any F words. We watched the dubbed director's edition, yes. which implies to me that the director wanted it dubbed. <laughs> right. So I didn't come across much foul language. Yeah, you know, I don't think there was any F words. So I I think it could get away at PG-13 in, in today's standards. There is um, very early in the movie, in the scene where all the sailors are drunk, I, I think it's the Hitler youth character who says it, that he was groped by the men. And the captain says that he was too. And basically it's a haze. Yeah. No, he doesn't. Sorry. He says he was molested. Doesn't say he was groped. He says he was molested. Molested by German standards. I don't know what that means. Yeah. Because for example, in Spanish. Was he in the car at the beginning, that very scene when they were being peed on? He might was have he been. referring to. Driving through a bunch of people urinating on the car as the act of he might have been so molestation. That's how I interpreted it. This movie, according to the sources I looked up, this movie does a really good job of sticking close to the source material, mm-hmm. and the movie and the source material never clarify what the hazing was. Okay. Now, in Spanish, the word for bother is molest. That's really what it means in English too. We just have very specific context for it now. Yeah. Quit bothering me. Direct translation from Spanish would be quit molesting me. Oof. So there is a question of like, what is sexual harassment in German culture at the time? Mm-hmm. Maybe he was being bothered. Maybe he was being sexually harassed. The movie and the book provide no context. Okay. That's fascinating. That is something that would also affect uh, a content rating. And and based on how ambiguous it was, I think you, you can still get away with that PG-13. Yeah, I agree. Before I get into the ratings and stuff, a comparison I was making a lot through the movie, I live vicariously through comedy movies. When things happen in my life, I compare them to scenes that I've seen played out in movies, specifically in comedies that I'm like, to you know, to take heart. Like when Lloyd is trapped in the bathroom in Dumb and Dumber? That is 
all too often. Yes. <laughs> um, the only other submarine movie that I can think to my mind that I've seen is Down Periscope. Have Kelsey you not Grammer. seen uh, Hunt for Red October? I have not. Mm. I've seen many Octobers. Yeah. I've just not seen the hunt for the red one. Yeah. Um, it's elusive. But no, Down Periscope, Kelsey Grammer, Rob Schneider. There's some There's some other bigger cast members. Like, or A submarine? Yeah, but it takes place in the submarine. But, but it's essentially, they're doing war games. They're essentially sending this um, Kelsey Grammer character out to see if he can prove himself as a captain of his own boat. So they give him these specific things to do. And it's about this crew, this this ragtag group of people, all funny in their own way. And they have to go do this submarine mission. If there was a yin to to this movie of Das Boot, like if there was a, if there was an opposite, it would be this one, making comedic moments of the fact that they're underwater in all these tense situations. So I kept I was comparing to the Kelsey Grammer movie just because it's the only other time I've been in a submarine, yeah, on screen. But so you've you not seen that movie? I saw it on TBS. Yeah, they played that movie so much as a kid. I don't remember it. We we played this movie probably quarterly in our house. We had my we had it on VHS back in the day. Oh really? Yeah. It's so like this was one of my mom's favorites. It is one of my mom's favorites. She's still living. Thanks for listening, mom. Lots of one liners. It's it's a it's a hilarious movie. So down Periscope, if any of our listeners out there can uh wanna chime in, in the comments if you agree or disagree. But but yeah, that's the only other submarine movie I've seen. So you've seen a hunt for Red October, I'm assuming? I saw Hunt for it October more recently than Down Periscope, but so far ago that all I remember about it is that Sean Connery is in it. <laughs> like that's is that also a World War II? Or? Uh, no, it's Cold War. Cold War. It's a oh. Tom Clancy novel turned into a movie. Oh. Sean Connery plays the captain of an American submarine, I believe. They're hunting a Russian submarine. Okay. Okay. I believe. I'd watch it. I'd watch it. I'd- yeah, it's, it's a pretty well-received book. I've definitely heard Maybe. of Home for Red October. I've just never seen it. Yeah. I don't remember it. All I remember in Down Periscope, and this might not even be true. I'll correct you if it's me. Is that Kelsey Grammer at one point says Down Periscope and gets hit in the head when the periscope comes down. And that might not even be true. I think that does happen. It feels think, like it should happen. That's like, that's one of like. Down Periscope. That's one of like the, the just the more minor moments. Yeah. Like, like but like, I love physical comedy. Yeah. No, there's, this a movie lot. has a lot of physical comedy in it. Um, so yeah, the um, guy that played. Do you know the movie? Um, maybe it'll hit the top two fifty, and we can cover it one day. Uh, what's well, well, this may be our only chance to talk about. It. So let me let me <laughs> just let me just bring up this actor real quick because because as a kid, oh um, Harland 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 Williams. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he's in this movie. I think he's Canadian. I hope so. Harlan Wayans, <laughs> one of the Wayans brothers. Yeah, so yeah, he's a Canadian actor. Lauren Holly. Uh, he's from Toronto. Yeah, William H Macy. I always uh, confuse Ken him. Hudson Campbell. I always confuse Harlan Wayan Williams with um, another Canadian actor, Justin Bieber. Yeah. No. Uh, oh, this is I didn't know. No, and this this actually really excited me to read. It shouldn't have. <laughs> He's the a cousin to Kevin Hearn, who is a keyboardist for one of my all time favorite bands, Bare Naked Ladies. Oh wait, Harlan Williams is connected to Bare Naked Ladies. He's a cousin to the keyboardist for Bare Naked Ladies. That's that is fun. I, I guess he's the uh, he's good for you, Nelson. Guess what movie he debuted in? Harlan Williams. Yeah. Um, well, I'll stop scrolling on IMDb before I get to the answer. Um. Was it the movie about the monkey? Uh, Rocket Man? Yes. He's in Rocket Man, okay. but no. Because that's the movie I first introduced. Was yeah, introduced oh, to man, him. Rocket Man's great. I do not, I do not, I'm looking now, but I don't know what his. All right, I'll give you a hint. Okay. It's one of three movies made in the same year by another Canadian actor. That tells me nothing. Jim Carrey made three movies in his first year making movies. Okay. He made Ace Ventura. Great movie. Dumb and Dumber. Fantastic movie. And The Mask. 
Those were all the same year. Those were all the same year. Those were his first year making movies. Jeez. And in Dumb and Dumber, Harlan Williams is the police officer that says, pull over. And he drinks and Jim the Carrey pee, says, right? no, it's a cardigan, but thanks for noticing. And he drinks the pee, right? Yeah, he He's drinks the pee. Yeah. You've been sipping on Grandpa's cough medicine? <laughs> That's right. Um, but I always, can, I always mistake him for another Tom Green. Tom Green? Yeah, also Canadian. And I always confuse the two. Yeah, no, Harlan Williams, Rocket Man's great. None of that's relevant. None of that's relevant uh, to this but, movie. Um, but Harlan Williams is uh he's a funny guy. Um he's in and he's in Down Periscope. Down Periscope, yeah. Which is a submarine movie. And we uh we just you watched know, a I recently movie. watched a submarine movie. Did you? Um a was German that movie one. rated eight point four out of ten on the IMDb? Uh, maybe. <laughs> yes, yes it was. <laughs> It's currently at seven, number 78 on the top 250 as of today. It debuted at 95 in 1996 and then went down to 110 in 1997, but then went up to 31 by 1999, which is the highest it's ever been. So it's never left the top 250. Never left the top 250. Hmm. And uh, it's down to what now? 78. 78, down from 31, its best position. Hmm. Currently sits at 98% tomato meter and 96% audience. So that's all the stats I have yeah. on the movie. And we've already covered mine. Oh, um, at any point in the movie, is there a title drop? Now, we watched it dubbed. Right. So, so does anybody mm, say The Boat? I didn't hear it. I didn't catch it. In German, they would have had to have said Das, das Boot. Boot. Yeah. All um, right. Listeners, if you know, please let us know when in the movie they said, the they said either The Boat or Das Boot. Yes. Um, das Unterwasserboot. Yeah. Oh man. So hey. So did you like this movie? How was your How was your first your only viewing of this movie so far? Well, as a man of very light complexion with German ancestry, mm-hmm. I am always very very nervous to enjoy anything that might make you sympathetic to a German soldier in the turn of the century. <laughs> That's fair. <laughs> that said. I really liked the characters in this movie. Okay. Uh, I thought it was really interesting how they went out of their way to show uh, how how common it was for German soldiers to not be all, so, all that differential to the Fuhrer. Yeah. In fact, within the movie, there's only, only like three characters that are like really big Fuhrer guys. And all of them are ones that like the movie – makes you dislike. I thought that was interesting. I really liked, but I, I liked the movie. I'm curious to see the movie in a theatrical edition mm-hmm. because it does drag a lot, which I think is the point. A big part of the movie is just how boring it was to be a U-boat right. soldier or a sailor. Uh, it said 40,000 men went out in U-boats during World War II and 10,000 came back. Three fourths of the men that served their country in U boats died. Have you ever been on a military boat? Like whether like visiting, and, like you know, seeing like one that's set up as a museum now. Like the the uh, the McKin- is the Mc- the Wilmington. There's one in Wilmington. You know, if you're going to Myrtle Beach and you're going out there, like so I've st- I've been in that one a couple times. It's not a submarine. It's not German, but like I've and I don't even know what war it was part of. This is my only reference point of me like seeing what it's like to be on a boat in a military boat and stuff. And it's, yeah, it's tight quarters. So seeing that and then knowing that a submarine was smaller than the boat that I was on. Yeah. Like that was probably most fascinating aspect of this whole movie for me was just, just watching these guys try to survive in this little can of sardines. Yeah. Are you familiar with the YouTube channel smarter every day? No, but I feel like I need that in my life. You would love it. Destin man from Alabama former NASA scientist, now making YouTube content. He He's very much an engineer, but he's probably the most charismatic engineer you'll ever meet. And he did a series a couple years back on atomic submarines. He did a series recently on Coast Guard ships, and he kind of explores the efficiency of space on these ships. Okay. Um, now, to answer your question of have I ever been on a military ship, I lived on a Coast Guard ship for like three years. Is, are, is, it, is a Coast Guard ship different than like it is not as economic on space okay but it's still way more efficient space use than like a a house or apartment 
Okay. It's tight. Like, for example, all of my personal belongings had to fit under my mattress. My mattress lifted up. And there was like a little area there. That was where I could put my laundry. There was like a high school sized locker. And that was, that was it. That was my. That and you was, lived on the ocean? Uh, I lived parked in Lake Charles, Louisiana. Oh, so you weren't like. This the, is when I was, my days when I was doing. Uh, the, the cooking, the cooking stuff. Right? Yeah, yeah. When I was like, in a cult. <laughs> but you were, you were on a boat, but the boat was not moving. It, it was, it was, Correct. it was stationary. Correct. So it wasn't, it wasn't the isolation of being submersed for hours at the time. Yeah. And we sailed from Lake Charles, Louisiana to Roton, Honduras, uh, through the Gulf of Mexico. So I, I did get some of the loneliness of the ocean, but that was really only a week. It was short enough that during the entire time it felt new and it was exciting and interesting, but I could see very quickly how that would become very, very yeah. boring and lonely. Yeah. Uh, I went on a cruise once. Very similar. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Me and my wife shared a, um, a room for two. Uh, we had catered meals and um, there was dancing. So. I said a bang, bang, a bang, and bang. <laughs> I saw a TikTok facebook youtube reel whatever mm -hmm. recently of a man who found himself in a peculiar situation of being on a cruise and being the only non-crew person on the cruise he had the entire cruise ship to himself they were still doing buffets they were still How is that possible? <laughs> i don't know but he was the only guy or so he claimed but you didn't see anybody else in the video hmm. well there you go that's a uh, that's a treat um, well, what, uh, what do you got first, Nelson? What's, what's one of the big, th I'm going to be honest, this, I've got some things. Yeah. But this movie was. Well, I want to, I want to start with a question that we don't usually do. All right. Hey, do you have a question for me, Nelson? Yeah. And it's one that we don't usually do. Oh. Who was your favorite character in this movie? I don't know if I had a favorite character. I had a character that I related to the most. Okay. Which is not saying much. I wouldn't say like the most is in like, I saw myself in him, but just like. It was the reporter. Okay, the war correspondent. Yeah. yeah because, and that is the character that you're supposed to right. see the world through. And, if, and for me, that was the one where I was like, he felt out of place mm. in there. And me watching this movie, there were times where I felt out of place because I'm like, what's going on? Like, like, like what's... You just, I just, there was, I don't know. I just, I, I related to him in the fact that he's, he was just, he was there to learn. He was there to observe and he was there to watch. And that's what I was doing watching this movie. Yeah. But also watching these things play out. He was also watching these things play out, but, but in a, um, in an analytical observation type way. Yeah. So, he was reporting. Yeah. That's what, that's what I meant to say. I would say the character that I related to most was the Hitler youth character. The one that got um, bothered. <laughs> yeah. No, uh, the character that I, I liked most is only in the movie for a little bit. He's in the opening act. Uh, he's the very, very, very drunk captain who gives a speech. <laughs> and he says, to our wonderful, abstaining, womanless Fuhrer. Who rose gloriously from an apprentice painter to become the world's greatest battle strategist. And then it cuts to the audience and you can see a lot of these polished looking soldiers starting to get apprehensive. And he says, what? Isn't it true? He's a great naval expert who took it upon himself in his infinite wisdom. <laughs> and then the people get like really tense and then he pivots to insulting Churchill. He just like quits where he's going with that entirely starts insulting Churchill. But like right there, I was like, I really like this guy. <laughs> Wait, so he was talking that, about Hitler, right? Yeah. yeah. He was and He's German, right? Yeah. So why would he be saying stuff that's maybe. It's, those were nice things. So like, right? Like, yeah, but he's being facetious. But why would he be facetious He's to the being person? Sarcastic. That's right. So why, as a German, why would you be sarcastic to the person that's leading in the time of war, the person that's leading the war for your country? Like huh. so so is he does that right. mean he's not for what Hitler's doing? That is exactly what that means. Oh. And I don't know if I interpreted that way. More I often I than that, not, not troops are not wild about the person that leads them. 
which I mean leads me to the question of well then why follow? And we've had Connor on twice now. Uh, his second episode's coming later, and and he kind of works to answer that question mm-hmm. of like you don't do it for the person that you work for, you do it for the guys besides you or the people back home. I'm not I'm not satisfied with that answer, but it is an answer. Okay. And I, I think that's also the big answer we get in this movie. Almost none of the characters speak favorably about their leadership. Right. They're not into it. Were you being facetious when you said, but that means he's insulting Hitler? Or is that... Not insulting, but just b- b- being passive-aggressive towards. Like, And I guess I just... Being that this is a German movie, and whether you're for Hitler or not, you don't want your country to fail in the midst of war, you know, like, sure. So like, but if you, so think- why would you, so insulting, like you can disagree with someone, but like, I feel like it's the same way as like, we make criticism of our president. Yeah. But like in the long run, I've never once criticized our, our president. I'm calling you out on that. Person. Um, but Prove in the it. long Prove run, it. but in the long run, <laughs> whether the guy you want to be our president or be our leader wins or doesn't win the guy that is in that seat or lady, depending on the time of, you know, year, the time of year. Yeah. Is it spring? Yeah. It's springtime. <laughs> um, springtime for Hitler. You don't want them to fail. Like just because you don't like your pilot doesn't mean you want him to fail while he's piloting your, your plane. Just because we don't like our president or we don't like our boss or we don't like the leader who's leading our war. We don't want him to fail. We want him to bring a victory. We want him to bring us sufficient closure on whatever we're fighting or quarreling about. You know, yeah. like, it's like we can have criticisms, but in general, for him to be in the military, yeah, like he's a military figure. Hey, he's a so captain, he, so he works under a U boat captain. Hitler, less than a hundred of them. Yeah, he works under Hitler. Yeah, for him to do that publicly, obviously he's intoxicated. Mm-hmm. He drinks every day. They, That's they right. said he drinks every day. Like. But I feel like those emotions that were coming out were like that was his true emotions. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like I just I had a hard I have a hard time computing that that's and that's maybe why I didn't interpret this way. That's I had a hard time interpreting like that's what he's wanting is to is to see the faults in his leader. Have you watched? I think it was Tom Cruise did a movie called Valkyrie. The uh, the 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 attempt on the assassination of Hitler. Yeah. I have not watched that one yet. I've watched the, the – wait. I did watch Valkyrie. There was another one that Daniel Craig did that came out around the same time. Yeah, Defiant. Yes. That's great I have great not too. seen Defiant. Defiant's but the, great. The Daniel Craig one, I did see Valkyrie. Okay. Because that's named after the song Valkyrie, right? Like that name comes from the, 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 the song – Valkyrie is the name of that song that he, the, the, the record player plays as the whole end scene plays out and it's called Valkyrie. I think Valkyrie was the name of the undercover plot. No, I just told you what it was. It's a song. <laughs> so I don't know. I don't remember because I, I saw it when it came out and I haven't seen it since. But that's a true story, right? They they really did attempt to, to assassinate Hitler. Right. Do you know why they attempted to assassinate Hitler? Right. The right of the Valkyries. Yeah. Yeah. Do you know why they attempted to assassinate Hitler? Because he's a bad guy. It's not because he was anti-Semitic. Anti-Semitism was not a uniquely German thing. Like Americans were anti-Semitic. Still are, unfortunately. Not nearly like we not were. Not nearly like we were, but it were, you're, you're seeing. You're, some, it's stuff. true. There's some anti-Semitism today. It's nothing like the anti-Semitism of the 20th century, early 20th century. Now, the reason that a bunch of military personnel plotted to assassinate Hitler was because they feared that his lack of tactical acumen was going to cause the fatherland, cause Germany to lose World War II. They wanted to take him out, replace him, but still like be imperialists. Okay, so all the people in this U-boat, they're all they're all willing to die for the fatherland. The captain there that's drunkenly berating and and, and getting ready to criticize Hitler. He's like, he's a patriot. Mm-hmm. He wants to win the war. He just doesn't think Hitler's the man to do it. That approach to leadership, I don't think we see a lot in America today. You mean assassinations? Um, <laughs> yeah. 
Uh, no, just the idea of like the country is more than the leadership. Mm-hmm. The country must succeed. And for that to happen, we must kill the leadership. Okay. We don't really see that in America. I think that's probably a function of the, of our democratic origins and, and history. Okay. I think that those sentiments, if you were to say them, people would agree with. But the way that they behave and speak about leadership doesn't show that, if that makes sense. Yeah, I got you. But I loved that facetious, what, isn't it true? He's a great naval expert. <laughs> like, like what, are these, are these other captains going to be like, well, no, he's not. <laughs> yeah. So by, by being purely sardonic, purely sarcastic, like he really like, it's a beautiful work of political satire, I thought. And I, I appreciate it with you, with explaining it and like, it kind of opening up that perspective to me, but like, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, you didn't catch that. Him. I just thought he was drunk and he was just being belligerent and saying nice things, but in a dumb way, like, because like, because he literally works for him. Yeah. It's like, and, and he's literally at a ball. It just, I wouldn't expect someone to say that in front of all the people that he either works for or works under him and knowing that there's people that have direct contact with Hitler in that room that would go back and report to him. But I don't know. They're just, that's why I didn't interpret that way. But anyway, yeah. so that is fascinating. You've, I definitely um, did not observe it that way. And that's, yeah. yeah. Um, I don't think I'm wrong in how I saw it. It's, I mean, it's possible that I am, but I'm pretty sure that was what was trying to be communicated there. Mm-hmm. It's the leadership doesn't like them. Now we saw a, a few things in that same party, right? Like for example, the the guy that is the captain, the main captain of uh, throughout the movie, he turns that same drunk and says, "Look at our new heroes, all wind and smoke, big mouths. Yeah, yeah, cheeks together, b- in hand, and the belief in our furor in their eyes. Mm-hmm. They will know in time." I think that again um, shows. The lack of reverence. Yeah. I appreciated, as much as I didn't like seeing people be drunk and literally like them depict someone pass out on the floor, like maybe even like checking yeah. on their own vomit and stuff. Like I've never gone to war, never been drafted, never been conscripted, never been in a, never been in something where I knew in the next couple following days, yeah. I'm going to be doing something that could be the end of me. So as much as like, I thought it was just dumb and belligerent and just, they're being stupid for Mm -hmm. drinking the way they are. And that same mindset, the more I thought about it, I'm like, how would I act if I knew that this was the last time I could let loose before potentially the end of my life? Right. And, and not even potentially like the odds are good, right? The odds are very good. Three fourths, this three fourths of U boat sailors die. After thinking about that, I've kind of, I still don't like watching that, but like, I was a little bit more sympathetic to all those people that were doing that. And like, because like they they're literally like, this is it. I kind of had that revelation as I was observing this movie and stuff. Yeah. That was, that was, that's kind of my thoughts for the beginning of the movie. Um, it doesn't go much beyond that, but we also know like Viking strength like that and other Germanic tribes, Celt strength like that, Roman strength like that. I think it's become uh, actually, I was going to say it's becoming less and less common, but we know alcoholism among American soldiers is particularly difficult, like big problem. Yeah. 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 People who are facing their own mortality, there are healthy ways to cope, but those aren't the easy ways. Mm-hmm. And escapism is easier. For the same reasons I don't, you know, Saving Private Ryan, uh, Full Metal Jacket, Paths of Glory. I appreciate the perspective, but like war films for me are not ones that I can go in and, and, and just observe for entertainment value. This one didn't have for emotional value. I was, it wasn't as impactful as something like Saving Private Ryan or um, Full Metal Jacket was, but visually and like shock value of what it would be like to be on a boat. And like in that whole idea of like, you're, you're literally blind the whole time you're down there. Like your visibility of what's actually happening all relies on the sound of a ping, you know, like that's fascinating. Um, and not just that, what someone tells you that ping means. Yeah. 90% of the people in this boat have no kind of radar or anything. They're just 
waiting for instructions. Yeah. So I appreciated the realism of what I assume is realism yeah. of, of, of what it would be like to be on that boat and stuff. Yeah. The, the scene where they're um, closer to the end of the movie or a third of the way through, if you're watching the director's cut where they, they have been on the bottom of the ocean for a while. They didn't, they weren't sure if the boat was going to move. Like they thought they yeah, in. in the Strait of Gibraltar. And if it did, it moved, they went up and they opened that hatch. You just see all these heads breathe in that air. Yep. I like that was a very visceral moment for me. You know, like that was, I've, again, I've never experienced that, but like that, that longing to have fresh air, that longing to breathe something you thought you weren't going to breathe again. Mm -hmm. That, that wasn't, that was like the fart of a loved one. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. For sure. That was, that was a visceral moment for me. Like, and I appreciated the emotion I was feeling of that when they, when they, depicted that in the movie mm -hmm. i have a fact here would you like to hear a fact i would love yeah. to hear a fact the cast was deliberately kept indoors continually during the shooting period in order to look as pale as the real submarine crew would be on a mission at sea wow and all the scenes were shot in a sequence all imdb all the scene scenes were shot sequentially oh okay so all the beards were entirely natural that grew from so the they just the waited huge amounts of time between certain scenes? Yeah. That's wild. And they were all filmed in tight, compact spaces. Like, it wasn't just, like, the camera view made it look like... Like, they were all filmed in what was a fake submarine in some studio. Cameras they, were so much bigger back then, too. Yeah. Like, like, the quality of film you could get on an iPhone today. Yeah. But back then, that, that camera was, like... The size of a boombox. Yeah. To put it in perspective, this movie came out in 81. Return of the Jedi was 83. You know, it's like so very similar, probably same cameras. Yeah. Designs and stuff for using those movies and stuff. And yeah, I just, I thought it was interesting. The, um, the link, the links that they went into to try to emulate, emulate that claustrophobic. You guys are in a can, you guys are in tight spaces, tight quarters. Yeah. That was, I, I felt it. Yeah. Yeah, it feels cramped. I, I think that in the, at least in the director's cut, I don't know about the theatrical edition, I think that the crampedness you adjust to pretty quickly. Yeah. Because it's so long. But the movie does do a really great job of just portraying the boredom, the waiting. Yeah. And, and there's times in the movie where like I realized, hey, I've been checked out for a bit here. It's like, like, what's happening? Yeah. What's going to go on? Another line, especially with the, the Hitler's Youth character. I can't remember what his name is, but they refer to him that as that once and it's stuck. He does a really good job of showing the lack of reverence for the fear. I know we covered that a little bit, but another one was they're listening to the radio. And the captain says to him, Our masters in Berlin spend all their time coming up with new nicknames for Churchill. What do they call him now? I think that that lack of reverence for for leadership is healthy, especially in the context of military and and the state and all that. You, so, so what you're saying, just to make sure I'm hearing you right, it's healthy to have a lack of reverence of your leaders while in military. Like that should be the desired outcome. I think so. I don't think like that the, all military people should not like their upper commands. I just, think just in general, um, like what? Yeah, I do think that. Why? I think that a military that's too trusting of its leadership is too prone to follow unquestioningly. There's a difference though of being too trusting. Let me ask you this: and honoring, because like, because like, I am not too trusting of our leaders. Yeah. Okay. Let, let me let me think smaller. Let me think. Let me think smaller scale. So. Would you say a Nazi soldier who defects is heroic? Do a different example though, because like you're you're saying across the board. So not even Nazis. Let's say American soldier. Let's say an American soldier. Say that again, but use American terms. Because like, bear with me through the extreme example first. Okay. Because like, do you think it's heroic if a Nazi soldier defects to America during World War II? From an American perspective, yeah. Okay. 
And let's say he does it for all the right reasons, too. He's like, listen, Adolf Hitler is an anti-Semite. He's putting Jews in concentration camps, doing extermination camps. We need to put an end to this madness. You'd say that that's a good thing, right? Mm -hmm. A soldier who has blind devotion to his leadership can't get there. Those are two different things. You could be devoted and not be blind. Okay. At what point do you cross the line into a lack of reverence for leadership? When your direct command has given you reason to mistrust. Okay. So there's a chain of command. Yep. So say I'm, yeah. I'm the bottom of the totem pole in the military. Let's, You're the bottom of the totem pole in the military. There it is. Let's just say I have a great relationship with my upper command. You have a great relationship with your upper command. And we've been in like, and, and so it's not just a new relationship. Like I say, I've been in the service for, don't actually say, but, but I've been in the service for a while. Like, so we've been in, oh, we've been in cahoots for a while now. Yeah. yeah. You've been cahooting it up. We've done things together. We've seen things. We've been through things yeah. to where him and I's relationship is strong. And I know I can trust him. Okay. So if I trust him, mm -hmm. I trust that he has my best interest at heart. Okay. So that means the people that he reports to. It's coming down from him yep. that he's got my best interest. And again, and I can and I can take this outside of military too. Like I like this this is the same way I would see leadership if if I'm in employment or if I'm in church leadership. So it's like it's like it comes down to trust. Like, so it's not blind. I wouldn't say it's blind if you trust the person that's directly cor correlating it to okay. you. Okay. There's gaps, but I wouldn't say it's blind. Let's say, like in the situation presented in this movie. You, Submarines. You work in such a close co com co uh, quarters. Thank you. You work dimes, in such close nickels. dimes and nickels with your commanding officer as a submarine. And let's say that you're right under the captain, too. I'm right under the captain, too. Is the captain as close of quarters with his commanding officer? I don't know. Maybe. Could be. Is Possibly. he on the submarine with you? No. Then no. I, there's so a at lot, what point? There's a lot of. At what point does it become legitimate to question your leadership by your standards, by my standards? When trust has been either, when environment shows you can't trust, or trust has been broken. Okay. Like, and that could be for your next chain of command, or that can be three chains of commands from you. Okay. Well, in this movie, like, we saw the captain that they all trust. Right. Do exactly as he was ordered, which is right. go through the chain. The 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 Strait of Gibraltar. Right. And he knows it can't be done because it's too heavily defended. In the, the only British location in the Mediterranean is right on the Strait of Gibraltar, so it's the most heavily fortified. He knows there's going to be patrols, and he says, we're going to we're gonna go in, we're going to dive, we're going to shut off our engines, and let the current carry us. And that gets them stuck. And then you have the second-in-command say to the war correspondent, he knew. He knew it couldn't be done. And he followed orders. Okay. I get it in the case of this movie. Yes. I'm, I'm saying no that but the you, case of this movie is making the argument that like you have at the beginning where they're questioning the authority of the person at the top of the chain. Right. And then later in the movie, you're like, well, they should have all questioned the guy next in the chain. Right. I get that. But you said that it's good for people to not trust their chain of command in military. What I said was, it's good for them to be irreverent about the people in leadership above them. Right. If I, as a citizen of America, check the facts. Fact check I, true. I would feel more confident knowing that I had a military fighting for that, our freedom. That reveres their leadership? That respected and trusted the people guiding them through things. If I knew that our military was filled with a bunch of people that didn't trust the people telling them to do what they're doing, and it's all just a bunch of like, like, I wouldn't want that for our government. I wouldn't want that for our military, for them to have that ability to just go, nope, don't trust you. Like that makes me not feel safer. Okay. If, if you, you if you think it's, if you think it's better for them to have irreverence for their leaders, that that's, there's, there's lack of respect with that. There's a lack of trust. Like, and that doesn't make me feel good with the military if you're saying that's how it should be. Do you remember our conversations about the Nuremberg trials? Yeah, you've brought it up a couple times. <laughs> Do you remember what the Nuremberg defense was? 
Okay, hold on. We've talked about this a couple times now. Yeah. It's it's directly connected to the Schindler's List, right? Uh, we like, talked about it in Schindler's List. I think they reference it as well. Okay, what is it? I was just following orders. Okay, right. Okay. Yes. And that Nuremberg defense proved that that's not a good enough defense, right, to... That's right. Okay, great. And then we talked about it in Paths of Glory, Mm -hmm. the kind of corollary of that, which is, well, if I didn't do it, somebody would, which is the inevitability defense. Okay. In your mind, and I believe you agree with this, that neither of those are, are, are sufficient defenses for atrocity. Not... Not a blanket, like not good enough coverage for every single event that ever happens. No, all right. Not, not so, all. so how does an individual soldier protect himself against falling into those traps? We can't answer that question, and I know that's a cop out, but like, I think we can. We can't. Like, I think we can, and I think this all... movie does. No, 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 no. This is this is good. This is getting good, Nelson. I. <sighs> This movie doesn't solve this issue. Like, no, this movie highlights the problem and of, doesn't. Of, of, of uh, military people that distrust their captains? Of the complicated situation of following orders and trust and lack of respect for those in leadership. But you said this is how it should be. I agree. But the, therein lies, like, but, but you, is that how you want it to be? Like, you want our military to be full of people that distrust their next-in-commands? Yes. I, I very much want that. It'd be chaos. No. It would be accountability. There's a difference between distrusting and allowing for pushback. I, I'm i okay if people push back and go, are you sure? But for people to just, on every command, go, no. If you're telling me to this... I'm going to do the opposite or I'm going to like, or I believe the opposite. I don't want people to be just defiant just for defiance. That's not what I said though. It's close to what you're saying. No, 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 no. It's the extreme of what I'm saying. What is your definition of irreverence? Not having reverence. Not revering. Don't use the word in the definition Nelson Hicks. Let's define revere. All right. Paul Revere. So irreverent means lacking reverence. That is that is the the word. Okay, what does reverence mean? To revere. And to revere oh my means... Gosh. To These ver- words don't mean anything. No, no. And so now we get back to our root word, which was revere, which means to very much respect and admire someone or something. For example, Nelson Mandela is revered for his brave fight against apartheid. Synonyms admire, idolize, venerate. I think it is right and appropriate, first of all, for people not to idolize and venerate I agree with other the people. idolization, yes. But to, to respect? No, I found here. What was the first word? Admire. Admire. Idolize. Admiration. And venerate. I think it's safe for people to admire the people that they're under. I don't think I don't think you should idolize them and make them gods, but I I don't want people under the command of people they they don't. One of the criticisms of the Hitler's youth character is a young machine. He operates without question. That's a criticism of that character. Yes. But he is the perfect archetype of what a Nazi soldier was expected to be like. He right. followed all of the instructions. Right. He revered those in leadership above him. Okay. Everybody else in the submarine is irreverent. And I would say not irreverent enough. So they don't want the Germans to win the war. No, because going back to what we said about the drunk captain at the beginning, it's not about Germany. It's about leadership. It's not that they didn't want to win the war. They thought that Hitler wasn't the guy to do it. But going back to American soldiers, and should they revere those above them? I don't think so. They should question authority. If what the authority is telling Every them to... Every command that's given, they should question it. That's not what I said. 
So, for example. Some of the questions given, they should question. Absolutely. Okay. I don't disagree with that. But I, I, but I you can't do that if you revere those above you. I think you can. I revere people. I admire people. I, don't, I wouldn't say I idolize people, but like, but I, I question some of the things they do. I think it's possible to do both. I think uh, there's many people I admire and I go, oh, I wouldn't do that if I were you. But if you take account, okay, so from a faith perspective, and, and maybe this is a little bit of a stretch, but like. No, no, no. There's no such thing as too much of a stretch. If you actually say it, and then I might tell you, you it's a stretch. If you, <laughs> <laughs> like, from a faith perspective, we have that knowledge that no one is perfect. So we do expect people to have error, to have fault. So because of that, I don't expect perfection out of anyone. But that doesn't mean I can't admire people. I admire my parents. They were imperfect. I admire my wife. Some would say she's imperfect. I would never say that. But like, I, I admire actors, actresses. I admire musicians. None of them are, none of them are perfect. Yeah. So like, I think you can admire people. I think you can respect people. I think you have, like, there are people that deserve respect, but that doesn't mean they're perfect. That doesn't mean that you can't go, wait a second, what? Like, doesn't mean you can't question them. So I think you can revere someone while also be respectfully pushing back and going, sir, madam, yeah, maybe check again. So, like, so I think you, I think you can revere someone, but also push back. So while admire is certainly a synonym for revere, it doesn't have the same context. Give it, me the context. So like, yes, they are synonyms in, in that they, they quote unquote mean the same thing, but they don't communicate the same level of respect. Okay. So with revere, you're getting to like veneration. You're getting to like respect so much to like the point of awe. Like, this person can do no wrong. I revere them. To be irreverent means you allow yourself to be in a position where you can ridicule. You allow yourself to be in a position where you can question. If you're questioning, you are not being reverent. So, is anyone worth reverence? I don't think so. Okay. I think all authority... So, not just specifically military. You're no. saying... Oh, your boss. I think all authority Church should leadership. be approached with irreverence. There is only one authority in my mind worth revering. Mark Twain. Paul Revere. Uh, the father of revering. Yeah. One <laughs> if by land, two if by sea. <laughs> and so, throughout this movie, we see this struggle of reverence and irreverence. Where we have this Hitler Youth character who represents the ideal German soldier. In fact, the other Germans mistake him for being the captain because he's well-groomed. I would say that if the other people in the submarine had had less trust for the captain, they would have questioned his strategy. But because he was duty-bound to do what he had been ordered to do, he nearly cost the lives of all those men. What about like, okay, I'm still stuck on the word revere here. What about like a spouse? Can Do you revere your spouse? I do not. I do not revere my spouse. Okay. I have more respect and trust in her than any other human. But for you. I do not revere her. If, okay. So for you, revere means godlike status. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And I don't that's, think that's what I was missing in your description. Yeah, and, I, okay. and I don't think so that's like, for so me. I think that's respectful of your leadership. You can be trustworthy of your leadership but to specifically have that revere status you think that's okay i that's what i need a clarification yeah i with okay it's a tier of like unquestioning loyalty and i think i revere you nelson i expect that <laughs> but i think we need to question those in authority above us but while having the freedom to respect Respect oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Be, be respectful. Okay, because okay. because that was my biggest qualm with what you were saying was like, and in my mind I was picturing just a, a military full of people who who were disrespectful, unattentive, and intentionally disruptive because you were saying that they should be 
that. But no, no, no. In that, what, like they what shouldn't I'm idolize their leadership. They, sh- they shouldn't idolize their leadership. But they should be. They should have the freedom to push back if they see and refuse instruction, safety issues, right? Because or... what you were saying, question. Well, sure, but what if I question and my what I'm told is no, this is what we're doing. I should be free to still say, well, I'm not. Like, okay. like right? Because like Vietnam War, U.S. troops committed war crimes. Uh, yeah, I, th- I think you think that checks out. Yeah, yeah, we like we weren't the exclusive ones doing war crimes, but we committed war crimes. And there were U.S. troops that said that questioned, and they were met with, "No, these are orders. Orders are orders. Good soldiers follow orders, and so they follow their orders." But we know from Nuremberg that's not good enough. I was following orders isn't good enough. And so, yeah, you develop that trust for your superior officer. I get that. But you still need to question that trust. Okay. Because trust for authority that's not questioned leads to really bad outcomes over and over again. Sure, it's less efficient if you're constantly questioning instructions. But at least then you know why you're doing what you're doing. Yeah. And you might even get some ideas out of it that are like, well, what if we did this instead? It would get the same outcome. Once I got to the bottom of what, what you were saying, I I don't disagree with you. Yeah. It was just that specific of what you meant by revere. Because like I just – I don't want a military that's just a bunch of rambunctious, disrespectful people. I think there is a level of respect and a level of um, admonition. I don't know if that's the right word. Admiration? <laughs> no. No, we talked about that one. But well, maybe Admiral, but, like, but just in general, like, I just don't want a military full of people that are just defiant because that's how they should be. Like, no, yeah, like so, literally doing the opposite of what they're told because I'm well, not, if, the, if the boss is telling me this, that means the opposite is correct. No, no. I'm not saying defiance is a virtue. I'm saying that a lack of veneration for those in authority is a virtue. Mm-hmm. And you can have a lack of veneration without being a rebel for the sake of being a rebel. You know what I mean? Yeah. I got you. I, I, I follow, you know, and, uh, there's a, there's a lot of space between the extremes. You know what I mean? Yeah. You're right. You're right. Going back to Hitler youth. There's two scenes where he's reading from a book. I could not figure out what book he's reading. And one of the two scenes, you only hear like a snippet of what he's reading. But the other one you hear quite a lot. He says, and actually, I'm not sure. Maybe he was dictating and the other guy was writing down, but I think he was reading from like their instruction manual. It's more than merely superficial to take care in one's dress and personal appearance. It denotes that the inner man is wholesome and upstanding. An officer should be thoroughly unpretentious in his dress and department. This, regretfully, has not always been the case. In the old days, Young officers used to be treated more indulgently in this respect, mindful that the German lieutenant had always been prepared to die if it came to saving the life of a superior officer. Dot dot dot. The con- like he continues to read, but then the conversation within the room right takes over. Takes over. That last sentence, I'm sure, gets tied back in in whatever he was reading from, but that last sentence doesn't really tie in right away. German lieutenant had always been prepared to die if it came to saving the life of a superior officer. Doesn't really have a whole lot to do with (laughs) uh, military dress. But I want to know how you feel about this sentence. It's more than merely superficial to take care in one's dress and personal appearance. It denotes that the inner man is wholesome and upstanding. This may be a little just vague to what you're saying, but just the first thing that comes to mind with this is just the idea of like dress for the job you want, you know, Sure, which is why my second day at McDonald's, I came dressed as an astronaut. Yeah, no. And I get that. And I, I admire that. I revere that. And as you should, (laughs) I have a hard time with students in school, specifically public school that are now have the ability and the freedom to come to school in mesh shorts, pajama pants, crop tops, hoodie, like just like not hoodie. I wore hoodies to school, but like, but just pajamas, pajamas. And I struggle with that because like, 
Not not that I'm for school uniforms. Are we old men now? We are. Not that I'm for school uniforms, and I and I and I'm not. But I am for school dress codes, like guidelines of like no midriff showing, no basketball pants that can be just depanced immediately. Like because like, like high school boys, like junior high boys, like it's fun to depants. It's fun to just go up on so like I've been like, depantsed. Yeah, been there. Like it is like, fun. I I feel like. <laughs> There is a level to the way you represent yourself physically in a situation to adhere to that situation. Now, I'm not saying you couldn't dress like a bum but get straight A's. It's possible. It probably still it probably happens. That wasn't me. But like I also grew up with parents that said, you know, when we're going to go to church, we're going to wear nice clothes. We're going to wear clothes that show reverence to, I mean, this is the word of the episode. You show reverence to the reason we're at church. The so pastor. The, the ushers. Oh, Usher. Fr- usher. Yeah. In town down, you know? And that still sticks with me. I have a hard time. I'm not a, I'm not judgmental about it to the fact that I'm like, don't talk to me, kid. But like, I have a hard time with parents that let their kids come to to church with basketball shorts on with, with just t-shirts on with like, like granted, I, I try to dress trendy and some of my stuff may be a little bit more street clothes versus like church or, or like, or uh, dress just casual. But in my mind, I'm still dressing up. So maybe I'm even wrong in the way I dress, but I do think it is important to dress for, for dress for the job you want and dress for the success you want. I don't think that's the only factor in it, but I think that does define. Jeff, right now you're wearing job. a shirt that's got a bunch of avocados on it. And my belly's. What's the job you want? A quirky game show host. <laughs> I'd be a great game show host. You would. You would. You would. Uh, I know that truth. I, I guess I don't think it's the defining factor. Yeah, and but and I think it is important to show. As people who show... listen to this show know, um, oftentimes on Sunday mornings I'm playing bass for our church worship band. And I never wear shoes. And, and I'm like a couple of weeks ago, I wore mm-hmm. shorts that were like a good, like mid thigh shorts. You looked and, good. And, uh, thanks, man. But and I wear it a lot wouldn't of Hawaii. be my attire for shirts. And I wear it's, Hawaiian shirts. Yeah. And more than once, the shirts, the shirts are always on point. And more than once, uh, the the pastor, the worship pastor at our church, has said to me, Nelson, uh, I love what you're wearing. Um, you will not be wearing that Sunday morning. And he said that to me like an hour before Sunday service. We're like, hey, yeah, I, I need you to change. So like, I, I certainly push the envelope of what's acceptable Sunday attire. Do you do it intentionally or do you just, do you just wear what's comfortable? Like, is it more of just, is it a comfort thing or is it like you want to dress for a specific vibe? The three times where our friend has told me. He will be on a future episode. I hope so. Yeah. He doesn't watch movies. No. He's actually blind. The th- <laughs> so he's actually black. <laughs> <laughs> the three times where he said no, all three times I was wearing something that like I was trying to see would he veto this? Why would you like okay, okay, I just to pick into your brain a little bit. When when you go to church in in churches specifically to be in the presence of God to learn to to be taught what Jesus is teaching us in, in our in our moment and in our life. Yeah. Why would you dress in an outfit specifically to poke buttons, to push buttons, <clears throat> defeating the reason of why? Like not defeating, but over. Not over. What word do I want to use? Adding a different reason of why you're going to church, or an, an additive, a supplemental reason to go to church. Yeah. <laughs> Like, okay, and this isn't a judgment. I love you, Nelson. I love. I, we're on the worship team together. Yeah. I think your dress fits your personality. <laughs> but why would you put something on in the back of your mind, going, "Will will I get comments about it?" Um. So I don't wear it to see if I'll get comments. Those three times. Well, actually, so the first time I didn't expect to be turned down. Okay. I wore a shirt that I'd worn before under our previous worship pastor and under under this same guy. Um, that was my Mick Nukes t-shirt. Mm-hmm. And that was just happened to be like, it was like the second or third time I've worn it while he was uh, our pastor. It was the first time he'd noticed. 
And he said, hey, um, that's that's a little over the line. I was like, yeah, okay, fine. And I told him I told him the very first Sunday that he was with us, hey, uh, I dress a little bit more flamboyantly than some. If I ever wear something that's over the line, I give you full veto power. And, and I trust that you'll use that. Because you revere him. I was, that, was, that was a joke. I respect. I, I willingly choose to submit to his authority. I got you. Right? Yeah. And I've given the same little blurb to the lead pastor. Like, hey, if I ever wear something that you feel is over the line, let me know. Like, I, I, have, I have zero issue submitting to church authority. Now, Isaiah is also a friend of mine. And I like to mess with my friends, as you know, as one of my friends. So the second time was I wore my sun hat. Which is, it's a, this great big sun hat with, like, Hawaiian print on the bottom. And and here's the thing, like, I would have worn it if he didn't say anything. But I brought another hat. Because I expected him to say something. And that was... So you did that as a practical joke. Not as an actual, like, yes. statement of... Yeah. Authority. Type. That's right. Okay. That's I right. I got you. I'm all for practical. And then the third time was I was wearing Respectful. my sunglasses. You know the new sunglasses I've been wearing? Yes. They're a little loud. Yes. And, and I wore them. I wasn't thinking anything about it. I had a headache that morning. And I had gone to a comedy show the night before. Had at the at the generosity of a friend of mine had a lot of old fashions. What comedy show? Uh, Dave Smith. And Robbie the Fire Burns. Wait, Dave Smith, like the political commentator? Yeah. Okay, gotcha. Oh, man, that was a great show. I had a lot of old fashions at the generosity of a friend of mine. So I had a, a headache in the morning. And so I wore, actually, no, wait. The comedy show was Friday night. Then Saturday, we had a, just a very long day. So I just had a, I had a normal migraine. I wasn't hungover. I had a normal migraine. And so I wore sunglasses because I had a migraine. And... I've worn sunglasses on Sunday mornings in the past. It's not been an issue. You're not the first one to do that either. No. And it's not been an issue. I get headaches, right? Not hungover, just have a headache. But these glasses were really loud. And Isaiah said, hey, uh, you can't wear those. I was like, yep, okay, fine. I fold them up, suck them in my guitar case. I have no problem submitting to church authority. Mm -hmm. The three times that this has happened, like only one of them was I really messing with Isaiah. And I w- wasn't going to wear the hat. I, w- I would have worn the hat if he didn't say anything, but I had no issue with him saying, you can't wear this. Right. Right. So I, I hope that answers your question. Because that's, that's a per- I got you. And, and, no, it does. And it with does. the sunglasses and the hat, Isaiah's point was, and it's a good point, they're distracting. And as a lot of people will say, like, the way I dress on Sundays is very, in some people's opinion, it lacks reverence. The stuff you wear, though, is not as distracting as some pastors I've seen through social media or <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hollywood pastors that I've No, I, I don't. I've seen some outfits that they've worn. I'm like, bro, tone it down. I don't wear anything. I don't on hear s- any Jesus right now. I don't wear anything on Sunday that I wouldn't wear any other day of the week. And conversely, I don't wear anything any other day of the week that I wouldn't wear on a Sunday morning. I'm glad you finished this statement. If you would have just said, I don't wear anything any other day of the week, I would have been worried about it. Like, so... Yes, you're right that when we come together on Sunday mornings, it is to worship. Even even if we're volunteering, even if we're just in the conversation, congregation, yep. we come to to serve and to be served by yes. the, the Holy Spirit. Yeah. I also, throughout my other six days of the week, am also trying to live a life that glorifies God. Mm-hmm. For some people, they feel that that means that they need to wear a suit and tie all the time. That's not common in our generation, but it exists. For me, it just means that I shouldn't be a different person Sunday morning than I am the rest of the week. I got you. I got you. Tying that back to what the (laughs) Hitler Youth character said. It denotes that the inner man is wholesome and upstanding. I don't know if a tire can do all that. Like without without the person saying a word, just just by the attire alone. So I would disagree with that because there's many people that I know that have money to throw at beautiful clothes, beautiful houses, beautiful cars, beautiful physical things. But the moment they open their mouth and begin to talk, their heart comes out. And then you go, no, this is all. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Yes. 
the physicality doesn't speak the full truth. Yeah. But it is a, the first impression. And it could be a false and first impression. I think the visual of me is pretty close to what you're going to get if you have a conversation with me. Let me close my eyes. Say something. Hey, Jeff. Oh, you're white. <laughs> oh, I was way off. Um, now, it, it, this line particularly stuck out to me because just before I watched the movie, I was taking a poo, scrolling on Facebook. As we all do. And I saw a Facebook reel. Mm-hmm. It was like man on the street type interviews where he was showing people two pictures. And he said, which of these two people do you trust? And it was like a crazy looking person, and a really put together person. And everybody's like, it was the, just pictures. They yeah. weren't videos. They yeah. weren't quotes. They were no, just pictures. Just like, look at these two people. Okay. Which of these persons do you trust more? And I knew from the pictures and my wife's interests that all of those put together, well kept people were like serial murderers. <laughs> <laughs> and all of the wild people were like philosophers and professors. Yeah. <laughs> like I recognized all the pictures. I was like, oh, I know who that is. I know who that is. And of course, they're going to pick the, the put together person. But that guy's a serial murderer. That guy's killed a bunch of people, put them in jars and hid them in his basement. Right. Like, mm-hmm. so that line of it denotes that the inner man is wholesome and upstanding, blatantly false. Now, we might assume that based on the way somebody looks yeah but that's that's certainly not true agreed i had a line here um yeah stuck out Hit me with it so it was a conversation between lieutenant warner and the captain mm-hmm. and lieutenant warner goes captain captain goes i'm sorry lieutenant warner goes you think it's hopeless now captain says it's been 15 hours mm-hmm. they'll never do it i'm sorry lieutenant warner says they made us all train for this day to be fearless and proud and alone, to need no one, just sacrifice, all for the fatherland. Oh God, all just empty words. It's not the way they said it was, is it? Just want someone to be with. The only thing I feel is afraid. Did you write down the subtitles? Yeah, this is this is the dubbed version. Yeah. So I don't know what the, and I wrote the down, translation is. So I wrote down the dub. Of okay. that. And the dub of it, not the subtitle, is they made us all dream of this day to be fearless and proud and alone. They told us it would be the test of our manhood to need no one and sacrifice all for the fatherland. Just empty words. I also wrote this down. The German's really good. Thank you. I've been practicing. Uh, Kinder beer. Sure, um, I'll take another one. Uh, that's beer for children. Oh, no, 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 no. I love Germany. (laughs) (laughs) Um, (laughs) Yeah, I I also wrote that down. That really feeds into my biases, as you can imagine. You have a couple. Yeah. So I I, want to turn it back over to you, let you talk about this. What what about this is is it that spoke spoke to you, that stuck out to you? If this movie had to be summed up in one phrase or a couple sentences, it would be this. You've got the, you know, we've trained for this part. So you've got that military acknowledgement of just, you know, these are people who have gone through their service of preparation and stuff. But then it talks about the, um, the isolation, you know, like they're, they're all, they're together, but they're alone. None of them are with their loved ones. None of them are with the people that they truly care about. They're all facing uh, mortality. This whole, like, I'm sorry, you know, this, this idea of just acknowledging that, you know, like, this is it, you know, like this I'm sorry. Like, this is how it's going to end. Um, so just it, this, this specific conversation, these couple of phrases talk about mortality, talk about isolation, talk about just the end times, you know, their end times, not yeah, end times. the end of their time. Right. And just this idea of like, when it comes down to it, what's important to them? The only thing I feel is afraid. I just want someone to be with. Yeah. Wow. When I feel afraid, I've never been on a boat, but I've felt afraid before. When I feel afraid, I just want someone to be with. 
whether it's my spouse, whether it's one of my good friends, depending on the situation that's got me fearful or that's got me stressed out or mm-hmm. the like, type of fear, the type of fear that it is, or the, the, the situation that's going on, there's, there's a different demographic of people that, that are going to bring me comfort in those situations because of their experience. Yeah. It wasn't so much a bias. It was just like, I think that this conversation summed up this movie really well, not necessarily the conclusion of the movie, yeah, but just what I'd spent the last three hours leading up to the conclusion watching Yeah, what I was experiencing. I was experiencing fear. I was experiencing the desire just for this to be over and for them to be back with what their loved ones and watching them do what they've been trained to do while not wanting to be where they were trained to be. Yeah. I would also say, and you know, because neither of us watched it in its original German or speak German. That is correct, yes. You're going off of the sub. I'm going off the dub here. They made us all dream for this day. Now, trained is one thing. And I agree that they, that, that they probably also trained them for this. But they made us all dream for this day has the implication that there's like a, a propagandistic side of this. Right. We've been propagandized Destiny. to believe that to be fearless and proud and alone is the test of our manhood. Need no one, sacrifice all for the fatherland. But that's all just empty words. Mm -hmm. Sacrifice all for the fatherland kind of goes back to what we were talking about with the drunk captain. The drunk captain was being very critical of the Fuhrer, but he still wants to win the war. And he's critical of the Fuhrer because he thinks the Fuhrer won't lead them to a victory. Mm -hmm. Sacrifice all for the fatherland. Not for the Fuhrer, for the fatherland. In American culture, our soldiers are praised for serving their country. They didn't serve the president. They served the country. Mm -hmm. I I think that there is, and I've said this in past episodes where we've talked about war films, you have to propagandize the soldiers. Otherwise, why would they do it? Now, these men were also conscripted. But you still have to propagandize even this conscripts. Otherwise, wait, everyone on that boat was conscripted. No uh, one was there voluntarily. The movie doesn't say it explicitly, but Germany did conscript a lot of soldiers, even from the Germans. Um, like a majority of the German soldiers at this time were conscripted. Let's ask ChatGPT. At least eighty percent of German military personnel were conscripts. Okay. Now, we do know that the Hitler Youth character, he uh, was born and raised in Mexico, but of German blood, and felt it was his responsibility. So we know he wasn't a conscript. There's, But nobody else in the film, do we know, volunteered or were conscripted? It doesn't say. But we do know that a lot of German soldiers were conscripts. So, okay, with that in mind, would you say that conscripted soldiers versus voluntarily enlisted soldiers, conscripted soldiers would have an easier time pushing back, challenging the status quo, not blindly following versus the people that enlist willingly. Would you say that they have an easier time just doing what they're told? Do you think there's a direct correlation? I think a enlisted soldier versus a conscripted soldier will rationalize it quicker. Okay. I don't think either soldier will have an easy time pushing back against authority. Okay. That is the route to court marshalling. Which is different than like a food court marshalling, right? Uh, yeah, because with a food court food marshalling, food they'll throw you know, food at you. Yeah, with a court marshalling, they'll throw ammunition at yeah. you through a weapon. Yeah, that's true. Those are different. Very different. So good point. So yeah, I I would say like a conscripted soldier is enslaved, right? So eighty percent of the men in this film, by by the data that we estimate, were required by law under penalty of death to serve. Mm-hmm. Okay. So yeah, I I would say that uh, they made us all dream for this day. That's the propaganda side because even when you conscript them. Even if there's a threat of death, you still have to, you still have to propagandize them. We saw that with the Vietnam War, right? You had a propaganda side. We had conscription. 
and we have men fleeing the country. Because even with the the draft, you still had to convince people that the war that that they had a personal uh, reason to mm-hmm. to to join the war. Okay. And then one of my favorite lines in this movie, after they finally get themselves out of the ditch, and they're on their way home, and they're all drinking a half beer each. One of the men stands up and says, "Here's to home, and an end to the war." Which tells us, and and they all cheer. Which tells us, the audience, that they don't want to be at war. Yeah. Now, that doesn't prove they're conscripts, but it makes sense if they are. Yeah. I don't think there's anyone that's enlisted. Well, no, I can't say The, that. the one guy, I think, is enlisted for sure. Because he wants war? The, 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 no, no, no. no. I get, my, to finish my statement, like I don't think there's any... I don't think there's a majority of people in the military, future, past, present, American, international, that are in the military hoping for battle. No. I don't think it's the majority. So no, I, I certainly not the majority, anyone, but they exist. Like, the, there's people in the military that have never seen battle that it probably enjoy their position, maybe enjoy working for that position. Yeah. But the people that are actually on the battlefront, yeah. I don't think there's anyone that's going, I'm glad I'm here. So I think there might not a shock to, I th- to have people go. I'm glad it's done. I think they exist. I think they are extremely rare. I think there's more people that enlist because they want to legally kill. Connor, when he was on for Full Metal Jacket, said that he is certain that they exist. It's very possible that once they hit the meet the reality of war, that they're like, oh, I did not realize what this was. Mm -hmm. But I think that even when you meet the reality of war, there are still people among those that wanted it. Like Lawrence of Arabia found that he really loved. Yeah. He's that. And that was the thing that he hated the most about it was they realized he loved it. So yeah, I think they exist. I think they're the minority. They're certainly not the majority that they're they're a small minority, but, Mm -hmm. but I don't think it's, reasonable to say that nobody does okay okay i only have one more note i've got one more quote hit me with it werner takes pictures of this is from imdb specifically from a quote off of imdb but i've went and looked for it after hearing it yeah werner is the war correspondent so yeah so i don't know if this is dubbed or subbed but i took this quote from imdb after i looked for it after watching the movie so okay werner takes pictures of the watch officers on the counting on the coning tower Captain says, take pictures of the crew returning, not putting out to sea. This is at the beginning of the movie. Lieutenant Warner, why? Captain, they'll have grown beards by then. It would shame the Tommies to see mere boys give them hell. Baby faces, ones that should still suck mama's breasts. Pause. Captain, I feel ancient around these kids, like I'm on some children's crusade. This isn't a major thought, but it stuck out to me. Just this idea of like, and it goes back to what we said earlier, like the, the propaganda type thing. Yeah. Now, like now, obviously, what he's taking pictures of isn't going to be used for the people that he's on the boat with. What he's taking pictures of will most likely be used in the future for more military talk to to future recruits. That's right. So it's just interesting how like that you know, and that, that's how I interpreted it. I was like, who's going to look at these pictures? Who's going to use? Who's going to value these pictures? And why would it be more valuable for them to be post-boat versus pre-boat? This goes back to a conversation earlier than that. Look at our new heroes, all wind and smoke, big mouths. They will know in time. He doesn't want men to enlist frivolously. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it just stuck out to me in that idea of just shaping or editing reality. Obviously, they did grow beards. They they did transition. They did do stuff in that time between from beginning to end. Whereas, you know, my Jeff perspective, you definition know, may, I don't know if this would be a definition, but like my desired perspective would be to see both a before and after. Have you seen like that before and after of that American soldier in world war two? Like a specific one. Like yeah. There's, there's, one, there's one. I've seen it several times. He was like 18 when he enlisted. 
and he enlisted like the last year of the war. Is this something I can look up? What what buzzword should I type to look this I up? I don't know. If I can find it, it will be linked below. Uh, World War. Search World War II soldier before and after. All right. So I searched for World War II soldier before and after, and I found a picture of, I'm going to screw this name up, but it's Evgeny, Evgeny, this, it'll be down in the comments. Yeah. Stepanovich, Kobe Tev. So there's three names and it's a soldier's face before and after four years of war. So, um, the left picture is, um, from 1941. Mm Mm-hmm. And then the next picture is from 1945 when he returned from war. Um, yeah. Drastically different. The hairline's the same. Um, but but he looks way older, doesn't he? Yeah. Um, significantly older. More than four years difference. Yeah. And it's wild what that does. And, and I think that that's what they were trying to communicate in that scene there. Yeah. It's like a children's crusade. These are kids going in. We talked about it, I think, in passing with Connor. We did Saving Private Ryan again coming out in a few weeks, but we—I I don't think we went into it. Is that the soldiers that they were offending in the dog tag scene? Spoilers, sorry. Oh no! Very young, and uh, with this, it's like you know we got these, these fresh, doe-eyed soldiers, sailors going into a U-boat. They will know in time, as the captain said. Yeah, no, I, I have not much to say to that other than yeah, it's just it's. I don't know if it's. I guess it's 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 a culmination of a lot of things. But like, you can fear monger, you can encourage, you can um, you can bait and switch, you can um, emotionally motivate people to enlist with pictures like this. You know, different types of settings. Whether it's the the young and agile, you think that those going- pictures would encourage enlisting? Well, different ones. Like, okay, maybe. Oh, okay. Like, like yeah, pre war. War correspondent yeah. photos. Okay. War correspondent photos. I thought you meant the before and after. I no. was like, no, that's going to discourage every time. I think there's always going to be an unintentional bias with whatever picture comes out when it comes to military photos. And or, I, guess, I guess not military photos, but. I would say there's going to be an intentional bias. But I would agree that you can't have a photo that doesn't have a bias. Correct. I guess that's what I'm saying. Yeah, like it's. It, yeah, like because whatever photos it, like, they may come not, out have been curated yeah. already. Because I'm not assuming every journalist has a specific bias. They now they have their own biases, but like some journalists do, just document and put it out in the air. Well, like, actually, on that, even then, that's not good enough. Because, for example, we have a picture from uh, Alabama during the civil rights movement. The state of Alabama. Yep. Whoa. Uh, is there a, is there another Alabama that I could have been referring to? The country band. There's a there's a country group called Alabama. Okay, and um, they have so, pictures. No, the state of Alabama <laughs> during the civil rights movement. It's a photo of a young black boy and a German Shepherd canine unit and a police officer with a leash. Now, at first glance, it looks like the police officer is using the German Shepherd to attack and intimidate this boy. I heard the boy and the officer in a podcast, both of them giving their accounts. If I can find it, it's linked below. The boy was saying that he just happened to be on the street during the civil rights protest. Wrong, wrong place, wrong time. He was out on an errand for his mom. I think I remember seeing this picture in my history books in high school, but the boy said the police officer is actually, if you look at the picture properly, pulling the dog back. He's not unleashing the hounds. He's pulling that dog back, reining it in. But that's not what everybody sees when they look at the photo. What they see when they look at the photo is a police officer using a dog to intimidate a young black boy. But what's really happening is a police officer protecting a young black boy who's in the wrong place at the wrong time from a dog who is heightened and stressed and anxious and ready to attack because of other things happening in the environment. And that goes back to what you were saying. Even a photo where the fo- where the journalist taking the photo, no bias, not trying to paint a certain picture. The result is still that everybody will look at that picture and they'll see something. They'll see something that 
either feeds their biases or maybe even changes their opinion. But the photo doesn't necessarily tell the truth. It doesn't tell the whole truth. Right. 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 Okay. And I mean, this brings up a great conversation. Like we live in a day and age of where, you know, phones can take a picture and then you can edit someone out. You can edit something like, like, like Photoshop's a lot easier now. So like, Famously, Stalin used to Photoshop his enemies out of photos that they were in with him. Really? Even back then. That's mm-hmm. fantastic. Yeah. I, I guess it's fantastic. there's a hilarious example where, where Stalin's on a boat with like four guys, but each of these guys he had killed off and you can see like, like down the road in history of different publications of the same photo where there's just a guy's missing until it's just him on a boat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like, like I, in the modern age, 2023, that is, is that what uh, year it is? Yeah. Um, Whew. you know, uh, the year of our King, the year of our Lord. Year of I don't our have a King. Oh no. I, um, I don't think anybody said the year of our queen. Oh, someone's for sure said it. I don't know them personally, nor did I hear it, but someone for sure said it. Uh, I I don't trust photos. Really? I don't. Hearing that Stalin did that and stuff, you know, like you know, just like I find that fascinating. So I just like let me ask you this then. When when you say I don't trust photos, and I've not even shown you the photo, I've given you an account of the photo. Do you believe that those photos that I've described exist? Yeah. Do you believe that Stalin is you. responsible for those photos? I feel like he can. Be. He has. He has the potential to. Okay. I was not there, nor have I seen these. So, like, so when you I say have a lot of facts away from validating this. So when you say that you don't believe presumed, photos, what do you, what you mean by that? I assume that I don't is see that what I see you, on social media. You be, you are skeptical of what you're showing. Many things I see, but you don't say like. I don't believe it. Unless it's a picture, like unless you show me a picture from your phone or like people I know are showing me things that they've documented. If it's someone that I don't know the party that's presenting the presentation, I'm skeptical of what's been edited out. What's been, what's been manipulated. What's so, what's even been filtered. This kind of goes back to our previous conversation, but a reference skepticism versus Mm non-belief. I don't believe means that I think that that's not correct. I'm skeptical of means that might be correct. I'm not sure of it yet. And I still need to be convinced. I would say that you're more skeptical. Is that right? Yeah. And and going back to our irreverence, I think people should be skeptical of those in authority. Nice. Nice tie in. Thank you. I've been doing this for at least two months. That checks out. I did the math in my head. Yeah. Um, well, no, I just, I just, I find it fascinating how like one picture can can say two different things depending on the medium that it's put on. Yeah, and, and I think in that in that quote that we were talking about of that um of that wartime, what was his position name? Uh, war correspondent. War correspondent. Lieutenant like, Werner. Like he can take a picture and he he experienced the picture that was taken, but the wherever those pictures go f- when they leave his hands people can t- share different stories with them. Yeah. Whether it's a recruiting firm, whether it's an anti-war or even like, firm, like even just the headline that it's next to. Yeah. Yeah. That's very true. It has nothing to do with the photo, but it could be right next to the photo mm-hmm. with a completely different article and, and sway that. Yeah. And, and as we've seen in modern era and, and I know it was no different then the body of an article and the headline of an article written by two different people. Mm-hmm. I follow this long time. Uh, news procurator Clark Kent, and he's been known to the Daily on a Planet. Lot of, yeah, 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 yeah. You've heard. <laughs> Sorry, he's got a great Substack. I, I read the newspaper as about as much. Like I'm, I don't read news. I don't listen to news. I honestly, Nelson, our conversations together, and you bringing up subjects and off stuff, mic. Yeah, correct. And then, and then I go out and pursue those informations after we've had some great conversations and stuff like. How often like, do you fact check the things I've said? And I'm wildly incorrect. I'm curious because, like, I I am under no illusions that like I'm infallible. Like I know I make mistakes, and I'm certain there's things I've told you that are just flat out wrong. A lot of our listeners just sighed in relief. <laughs> Ha, 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 ha.
<laughs> no, um, I, he's not delusional. He's just an idiot. <laughs> I don't think I've ever fact checked you outside of recording an episode because by the time we resolve whatever we're conversating about, I've come to terms with knowing your heart behind the fact you're saying. And honestly, because I've moved on to something else, I've forgotten it by the time we've recorded this. <laughs> but in general, like I've never left a conversation going that Nelson, I that can't be right. Like I've never left a conversation feeling uneasy. Like whether, because you know, we've disagreed about some, not a lot. Like we, we've disagreed about some and I've either seen your perspective, still not d- d- agreeing with it, but seeing it in a more clear way and going, okay, I can see why you see that. Or actually realizing that maybe I was missing something and I actually agree with you by the end of our conversation. So I have never fact checked you after an episode. Have you ever fact checked me on things I've said off air? Like during recording? Like during an actual... No, I just mean like I tell you something and then like later you're thinking about that conversation like, uh, I, don't, I don't know. And you look it up. I Not specifically to fact check. Like we've talked about things. Um, we've talked about many topics. You know, we have a podcast and we, we've lots of different conversations come up. And I don't, I've, I've looked up things not to fact check, but just to, to de- dive deeper. Sure. So, but I've never, I've never intentionally fact checked you outside of my computer checking something that as we're discussing okay. in the middle of recording, yeah. which I'm doing with you in person. Um, but I have looked stuff up. I have read stuff. I have watched things because of something you've said that I've like, I, I want to know more about this or I, I need more clarity. Not necessarily because I disagree, just because like I need the bigger picture. Yeah, I got you. you. Said. I've never distrusted you. That is a level of trust that I'm not comfortable with. Please start fact checking. <laughs> My yeah, last note on this movie is I've got nothing else. What an ending. Oh yeah, okay, yeah. Holy cow, yeah. Um that was a twist. Now, my question before we get into that ending. Yeah. Is this movie based on an actual is there is there historical representation of this movie or is it a fictitious interpretation of something that could have happened during World War II? Or does it follow historical things? You know what I mean? So fiction. F- f- truth. The movie is a very accurate adaptation of the book, which is a fictionalized account of the author's experiences as a war correspondent. So, while the novel is a work of fiction, it is heavily influenced by Buchheim's real-life observations and experiences while serving. the ending of this movie... Yes. ...which you just brought up, where they're celebrating... They're singing in the streets and then the sirens go off and they're bombed. They're, they're gunned down by airships, uh, planes. I think they call them, um, Zeppelins (laughs) Uh, of the lead assortment. Um, no, (laughs) the lead persuasion, the lead persuasion. No, um, they're, 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 they're attacked from the air. They're airstrikes. Yeah. And I just didn't know if that specific scene... By the heroes, the allies, the good guys. Is that specific scene a specific attack that actually happened in... Like, you know, so just... What what parts were representing actual historical battles or attacks? So the events are fictional, but, like, the circumstances, the conditions, Mm -hmm. the chain of command, the behavior... I love all the things. All of that, accurate. Does that mean that Buchheim was in a submarine that nearly sank, returned to port, only to be shot down and all the men massacred? No, but maybe that's an amalgamation of several stories of his. Mm, Right. I, I, I did not see that ending coming. I thought that that was wild and really highlighted the futility of wartime the drastic highs and lows yeah just that yeah. these men fought hard to survive were praised for their return to port only to be shot down unceremoniously yeah 
by the heroes of the story, the Allied troops. The heroes of our story. Yes. Some people may not see us as heroes. Are you writing apologetics for the Nazis, Jeff? No, I am not. <laughs> Jeff, how do you feel about the Jewish people? Love them. Oh, okay. Solves that. Love their matzo ball soup. Our matzo? Yeah, it is. Yeah. Love uh, delis in general. I just love, yeah. I just love all delis. Big um, fan of delis? S- s- salami. Love it. Is that Jewish? I mean, I just... Deli meats. Yeah, I just see deli meats as Jewish. Um, I'm just a humble goyim. Oh, I don't see gender. You know. <laughs> All right. Take us into wrong questions. <laughs> I may have just discriminated against myself. Um, no, 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 no. I, um, I'm very unfamiliar with the Jewish culture. To save face a little bit, like I, I'm definitely pro-Jewish. Uh, yeah, but um, now I'm just rambling. We may have to cut all this because I feel like I dug a hole. All right, let's like, get into wrap-up questions. Yeah, all right. All In right. light of racism, let's get yeah. into wrap-up questions. <laughs> oh, gosh, I hate all of this. It makes me so uncomfortable. <laughs> yeah. um, I'll cut it. I'll cut would you guys it. recommend this movie? By um, you guys, I mean you, Nelson. Now, as we've mentioned, we didn't watch the theatrical release. We watched the director's. I'm cut. curious to watch the shortened version of this. I am too. I'm not going to seek too. it out, but if someone was like, "Hey, you want to watch a movie?" I'd I'd watch it willingly. I would and I would go watch the theatrical sub only release of this. Yeah. The director's cut dub, which is what I watched, I wouldn't recommend. Why is that? Anything specific? Just, I think it's too long. I think the the point of showing the boredom of submarine life, I think, is overdone mm-hmm. in the director's cut. Now, it might be that the theatrical edition cuts a lot of interesting stuff. <laughs> That's true. Right? That's I true. don't know. But the edition that I Where's cut... all the action? <laughs> yeah, it's just... <laughs> Sweaty guys in a submarine. <laughs> and you know it smelled like farts. So many farts. Yeah. There's farts in Down Periscope. So oh, they do course. acknowledge the farts in Down Periscope. Yeah. Good. If you're somebody that's into World War II movies and curious about World War II history. And think, naval warfare, too. Uh, yeah, yeah, just, yeah, just yeah. Naval yeah. Warfare in general. I, I brought it into a naval warfare yeah. in general. Yeah. I think this is worth your time. I would agree. Even the director's edition dubbed. I think it's worth your time. Yeah. I don't think I'll probably watch this again. I might watch the the theatrical the theatrical yes. release yeah. with subtitles not not dubbed. I might watch that. But I wouldn't I don't think otherwise I would. And I and honestly I'd be surprised if I finish that one and say, I'm gonna watch this again within five years. Yeah. I would recommend Down Periscope or any other war movie before I recommended this one. Any other war movie? Yeah, that I've seen. Uh, no. I would, Pocahontas. I would watch this over Paths of Glory. Oh, you would? I would, yeah. I'd I, w- I would take Paths of Glory over this. I really liked Paths okay. of Glory. Okay. But overall, I enjoyed it. I definitely... It didn't feel like three and a half hours. Like, there were dragging moments. Yeah. But in general... I've seen longer movies that have felt longer. I've I've seen shorter movies that have felt longer and I've seen longer movies that have felt shorter, but like, but this movie, there were, there were fast paced moments and there were moments that I was maybe not edge of my seat, but I was invested. Yeah. But, but yeah, I, I don't know if I'd recommend it. I wouldn't, if someone brought it up, I'd be like, Oh, I'd watch it. Like, like I wouldn't like, if someone said, Hey, Jeff, come on over. We're having a movie party. And then you said, what movie? And they said, we're watching Das Boot. Director's Cut. I'd be like, I I have something else going on. I would honestly, I wouldn't even do that. I would say, oh, thanks for thinking of me. No, thank you. <laughs> that's very nice of you. I wouldn't even make an excuse. I that's would just be like, I'm not. That's why I revere you. <laughs> um, <laughs> would you change the rating? We are, which we already talked about this. So right. it's presumed to be rated R. Yeah, I would, I would, I would change, I, I would make a PG 13. I would make a PG 13 as well. I, yeah. I, I, I'm, I agree with you. 
Um, has it aged well? No. I I thought it did. Uh, some of those, some of, I'm not gonna say CG. Some of those move those shots, especially when they're on top of the boat. Yeah. It just there's some moments where it doesn't look realistic. It looks it looks studio. It that was not my fake. thought at all. I thought it looked very authentic, very real. Did we watch the same movie? I guarantee you we did. Okay. I would watch this if they remade it. They have? There is it was a sequel. It was presumed to be a sequel. Oh, that's that's a good point. Yeah. Like if they did a modern day telling of this exact story, I'd watch it. And I would assume it would be way better. Off the, off the I think if they were to remake this today, it would be far more critical of Hitler and Nazism in general yeah. than this movie well, was. Even if it was German made? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So I, I, and I might be wrong, yeah. but I think so. I think it is interesting to talk about. Like, So this movie was made in 1981. Yeah. Clearly by the 80s, the Germans realized Hitler's faults. Yeah, oh, oh yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Like, so like so yeah, so I definitely do like it's not like this they made this movie during World War II. And <laughs> this movie was made by is, is this Have you ever seen Inglorious Bastards? No, I have not. It's all on top two fifty. Then we will watch it inevitably. Within that, there is another movie. Is that World War II Inglorious Bastards? Mm-hmm. And within it there's a movie made by the Germans about a German sniper who held a village on his own. And uh I was expecting, because this was a German movie about World War II, I was expecting it to paint the Germans in a much more glorious light than it did. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we'll see what happens. I this Would this be on your top 250? I don't think it would be. My, yeah, no. I think it does deserve a place in the top 250. Do you really? Yeah. For cinematic reasons? For storytelling purposes? For historical acknowledgement purposes? Like what, what about it do you think deserves? I think for, for, for film production, for historical context, I think both those two reasons alone, it deserves a place in the top 250. Just not Nelson's. Not in my top 250. Should I put it in my top 250? No, (laughs) no. Uh no, this is this is close to the bottom of the list for me. Just under um I liked on the waterfront. It's, it's under Psycho, it's under Full Metal Jacket. Yeah. It's like it's, it's especially above, it's, above, it's just above Paths of Glory for me on my on my list. I, I would rank Paths of Glory way above this. Both of those, I, both of those are low. For I me. really enjoyed Paths of Glory. I I'm and, fun- and not in the same way that like Clockwork Orange has grown on me. Like I actually Enjoy Paths of Glory. So far in the movies we've watched, I'm finding that I do appreciate modern cinema more so than yeah. classic older films. Yeah. I have a hard time relating to older movies. Sure. Or being entertained or being fully invested in. How so many, I think that's part of it. How many animated movies have we covered so far? We've done five animated movies. No way. Do you want me to name them? I do. Okay. All right. Because I can this only is, think this of, is not I can any, only think of two. This is not three. any specific I can think of order. Three. This is, I'm just reading from my specific list, but um so we got Princess Mononoke. Yeah. Spirited Away. Uh-huh. Inside Out. Oh, that's right. How to Train Your Dragon. Yeah. Lion King. All right. I had forgotten Inside Out and Lion King. Is there any bias towards or or away from animation so far? Uh, <laughs> maybe international animation. <laughs> oh, interesting. <laughs> so Lion King's my number one movie so far. Really? Specifically of the movies we've watched on this podcast. Yeah. It's not my favorite movie. Of, like, no, I, no. I, I, I still know my favorite movie and that, that's not changed since yeah. what we've watched. And that's Steve Martin's The Jerk. Absolutely not. Maybe though. I actually not seen it yet. So All right. I'm, I'm holding out hope. I'll make you. But, um. But of the movies we've watched, Lion King is my number one. And out of all the movies we've watched, Lion King is my number one. But Princess Mononoke and Spirit Away are the lowest two of the five we've seen. Oh, okay. So I, are they are they below the halfway point? Yes. They are both, both of them? They are both below the halfway point. This is movie number 
Are all three Western animations above the halfway point? Yes, coach. Wow. I'm excited for the ones that we're going to watch in the future. Yeah. I just, I have a harder time being entertained by them. Interesting. Okay. Lion King entertained. Lion King has the best soundtrack. Lion King has a great story. Lion King is a visual story. Best that movie I'm, ever made. I'm nostalgically connected to. Yeah. Then How to Train Dragon and Inside Out are both movies that I've seen multiple times. So maybe just by nostalgic and uh, consumption reasoning, mm. I'm more attached to them. I've only ever seen the two Studio Ghibli movies that we've seen. Ghibli. Once. You're ridiculous. <laughs> I've only seen them once a piece so far. It's like, yeah. so maybe it'll change if I review them, but, and we've, there's way more animated movies in our future. Yeah. Um, at least one. Yeah. But yeah, no, I don't, I don't think it, I, I think culture could be a part of it, but not because I don't like it, but just maybe because I, I have a hard time connecting with it. And I, I've still not ranked all the episodes, all, all the movies we've watched. And the more and more we talk about it, I feel like the less and less you're going to do it. Same. <laughs> we're, we're over 30 movies in, man. If you're not going to do it. No, anymore. no, no. We are 30 movies in. This is episode 30. We've recorded one that will be released after this episode. I know. I know. This is episode 30. I'm, I know. Das Boot. Oh, man. What, das is, what is our next episode? Boot. What is our next episode? That's a terrific question, and I have it right here in front of me. Give me one moment. Our next episode, long-time listener, first-time caller, mm -hmm. Hunter, will be joining us for The Thing. The Thing? Have you ever seen The Thing? I, I've i seen a thing, but I've not seen The Thing. Whose thing? <laughs> I've seen a couple. I've um, seen my own thing. <laughs> my wife and I have a thing. Good, good for you. <laughs> yeah. I've had a thing three times that I can prove. I've had a thing removed by a doctor. <laughs> uh, I hear that's very popular these days. <laughs> Anyways, yes. Hunter and I go way back um, through mutual friends. So I'm excited to have him on the show. He is he's listened to all of our episodes so far, I believe. And I'm excited to finally have him on. And, and uh, he's, 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 con he's, he's conversating with he me. said it in the plural. Yeah. So very exciting. So – as you, other listeners, the more you interact with us, the more you have a chance to be on an episode in the future. Yeah. So, and that's not just be being coy. If if you interact with us, we would love to hear your more more opinions from you. So, yeah. please reach out. Please share your opinions. Please our, talk. To our us. very first guest, Nelson's phone number is. I'm sorry for all the quacks. There's nothing I could do about it. <laughs> What were you going to say about our very first listener? Sarah. Yeah. She was on because she was a fan. Yeah. And we paid her big money. Yeah. We're she, still she paying She got 100% her. royalties from that episode. She did. She did. Every single dollar we made off that episode, she's she right into her pocket. Every single That was dollar. basically a Make-A-Wish Foundation episode. I'm like the John Cena of podcasting. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Oh, we've gotten out of hand. <laughs> We need guests to keep us reined in. So join us next week as we have Kurt Russell on the episode for Sorry, Hunter. Kurt Russell's You're thing. Out. <laughs> this is Kurt Russell's, Kurt thing. Russell's thing. The Kurt Russell's thing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Thanks for listening. We had a great time putting this together for you. To join the conversation, find us on Facebook and Instagram at Silver Screen Biases. And on Twitter at Screen Biases. We believe in value for value, so if you found value in our show, we ask you to consider supporting us. Links to our social media and support can be found in the show notes. <laughs>